ladies and gentlemen, Miss Robin Frederick. Really happy to be here to talk to you about streamlining your songwriting process so that you can write faster and better. You do not have to sacrifice quality for quantity. You can write more songs and better songs at the same time. So I'm going to give you a whole bunch of information in this hour that will help you do exactly that. But first, I want to talk to you about why it's so important to be able to do that. As a successful songwriter, you want to have a catalog of songs. A catalog of songs is probably not five songs. It's, that's a small catalog. Um, it's okay, a catalog. Um, but you want to aim for 20, 25 songs that you can actively pitch, things that you can send out for uh, when you're, whenever you get a pitching opportunity, a listing from Taxi or a pitching opportunity, a music brief, um, anything you're writing for, even if it's your own album as an artist. Give yourself a deadline. You want to write songs, more songs than you need for that album. Okay, so the idea of having a catalog of songs to start with is a really good goal. So aim for anywhere from, say, 20 songs to 25, and eventually that'll be 35. And over the course of your career, that's going to be hundreds of songs, right? You're going to write hundreds of songs, just admit it. Because if you're going to be successful at this, that's what you're going to have to do. And those songs will need to be something that you can actively pitch. So getting that catalog of songs together is the first goal of writing faster and better. More songs means more chances to pitch. More chances to pitch means more possibilities for placement. It means expanding your audience or fan base if you're an artist or band. It means uh, creating a track record, something that's very important in the music business. You look more serious if you've got a good track record, of course. And also it means with every song you write that you increase your opportunities for making money from your songwriting. The more songs you have, the more potential you have to do that. The other reason to write more songs uh, that are pitchable is because, and, and to be able to write faster and still write pitchable songs, is because everything in the music business has a deadline. Um, when you first started out writing, you didn't have deadlines. Then you could write to the bedroom wall and create your first album or your first EP or your first singles, and you had all the time in the world. But once you do that, as an artist, you're going, your fans are going to want to hear more from you. This is more true now than it ever was when people could take a year or two to make an album. Now they expect to hear a single every couple months, maybe, if you can do it. Okay, so you want to keep in touch with your fans. So that's the first thing if you're an artist or a band. If you're writing for film and television, the deadlines are, are pretty obvious. A TV show that has uh, weekly episodes, they need to get those songs in there before that episode airs. they got to get them in, get them edited in, and, and, and have them working before it airs. And the problem is that music is almost always the last thing that a TV episode or a film thinks about uh, because... The, everything else happens first, right? So the script writer takes a little bit longer than anticipated, and then the shooting on the stage takes longer than anticipated, and, and then uh, editing took longer than anticipated. And there you are at the very end of it when they go, oh, yeah, and we need a song. Um, and that's what happens. There's very fast turnarounds at the end of that process just before something airs. Um, uh, commercials are the same way. TV commercials have air dates. Films have release dates. Um, and, and music publishers who are pitching to artists in the studio, you may think they don't have a due date, but they do. Um, they're in the studio and they want to get that, fin that album finished this week because that's what the budget will allow for. So they're in there and the um, song that they thought would be the coolest single of all time didn't turn out quite to be that good. And so they're looking for another song, a slam dunk hit song please please right now and they put that out to all the publishers they know the music publishers and the music publishers then go to all the good songwriters they have on their roster and they go quick we need a new song for Ariana Grande she needs a hit single because she doesn't got one okay so that's when you get the brief <laughs> that's when you hear about it is when they are desperate to get it really fast so faster and better is really the way to do it because if you're going to be pitching actively that's what you're going to need to do okay so, what you need to learn how to do is to write good songs quickly, right? To finish everything you start. I'm going to be coming up 
against that more and more as we I go through this hour. Finish everything you start. You don't have time to get halfway into a song and say, oh, I, I can't, I don't know what to say in the second verse. I, this one isn't working. I, I don't like this. And start, I, I'll have to start a new song. <laughs> you know, and by then you've wasted 24 hours and you've only got six hours left. You can't get halfway through a song when you're on deadline and and decide that you're going to have to start over because the time is of the essence. Time is limited. Okay, so finish everything you start and express yourself authentically and honestly. You can't write mush. You, you know, this is not about writing junk. I want you to write better songs, your best songs, um, as fast as possible so that you can be pitching really good songs because that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for mediocre mush. They're looking for really good songs that speak authentically and honestly and sound like an artist wrote them, somebody who cared. So that's what we really want to do. We want to make those three things happen. Um, write good songs quickly, finish everything you start, and write something that you're proud of that came authentically from your heart and you, and you meant it. Okay, so that's where we're headed. Now, if you want to know where I learned this stuff, um, I learned this stuff um, years ago when I wrote um, for a Disney Channel. And I wrote over 200 songs, wrote and produced 200 songs in three years. I was writing for a daily show. I had to write three to four songs a week. They usually gave me the script on Wednesday. Then I would start writing. I would spot the script on Wednesday night, meaning I would look to see where the songs were going to go. I was writing ahead of the shooting schedule. That was the kind of job I was doing. It's a little bit unusual now. We we write songs ahead of time. But in this case, they gave me the script. And uh, the next day, Thursday, I would start writing. I would write all day Thursday, Friday. And by Saturday afternoon, I had to hand over raw demos, just me and my electric piano, uh, to the arranger. The arranger would take them, arrange all the parts for all the songs, and take them to the copyist on Sunday. And the copyist who copied out all the parts for the musicians would have Sunday overnight to be copying. That poor guy like, had no time. And um, on Sunday morning, the copyist would put them on the music stands for the, art, for the musicians, and I'd be there, and it would be downbeat at 10 a.m., and we would cut all four of those songs. And then the other songwriter, there was one other songwriter who was doing that too, and Phil Barron, and he would bring his stuff in, and the band would play his stuff and produce it and get it mixed and get it over to the stage so that the actors could sing their parts to it. And if we didn't finish our songs in time, and the arranger in time, and the copyist in time, then there was nothing for the stage to shoot on Tuesday. And that was $20,000. So now it's a lot more. Trust me, that was, that was cheap then. Uh, it's not that now. So if you have to, you can do this. Of course you can. And if you get the opportunity to do it, you're going to do it. You're going to say, yes, I made good money. And those shows ran for 15 years. So I made good money for a long time. So if you get an opportunity to do something where you have deadlines like that, and that is what you're in. You're in a business with deadlines, whether you've got a script or you don't have a script. Give yourself those deadlines if you're not getting them already. Use those taxi listings for the deadlines and practice writing to them because that's what this career is going to be all about. Okay, so now let me give you four massive time wasters. You'll recognize them, I bet, and maybe you won't recognize them all, but you still do them and you just don't realize you're doing them. So I'm going to give you four massive time wasters, and then I'm going to give you a lot of time savers, some of which will address those time wasters and others that will just save you time and maybe you haven't thought about them yet. Okay, so let me start with the four time wasters, all right? The number one time waster is wondering what to write about, okay? This is when you have a, uh, let's say you have a music brief or you have a taxi listing and you, um, you go, yeah, I'm going to aim for that. And you sit down and you say, okay, I've got my guitar, I got my, my keyboard, or I'm, I write on, maybe you're writing lyrics on the page or something. And so you get, you sit down, you get all comfortable, you get your favorite thing to drink when you're writing, whatever it is. Um, and you're going to write and, okay, here we go. Yeah, write going now for it, going to write now, crickets, nothing. You haven't got an idea in your head. 
right? Because you're not feeling creative. You're feeling pushed. You're feeling rushed already. And so what you get is nothing. And after you sit there for a while, that's a time waster, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, if you sit there for a while, then you come up with something. And usually it's the something is something in your comfort zone. It's something habitual that you've used kind of before and you're going to tailor it a little bit over here and change that lyric and, I don't know, make it a different genre or something. Um, but it's something habitual and comfortable for you. And that's what your idea is that starts your song. All right, so that's going to be a bit of an issue because pretty soon you're going to be working on that song. And you're going, oh, yeah, I've sort of written this before. I don't know about whether I this is any good. I don't think it's good. I'm bored. I'm bored. I've done this before so many times. It's just not good. And it didn't work last time I did it. I didn't get forwarded. I didn't get the placement. I d oh, this isn't working. Stop. Full stop. Yeah, that's a time waster. Okay, that's the time waster. That's the biggest one of all, I think. Okay, so that's the number one time waster. Okay, number two time waster. This one's interesting. You may not have noticed it. It's misusing or overusing uh, inspired lines. Now, inspired lines are something really good. We love our inspired lines. Um, they come along, they, you know, they hit us like a brainstorm, and, and we go, oh, those are such great lines. I love those lines. I've got to use those lines. And so a lot of times we just put them right into the song we're working on without really thinking about it because, well, it occurred to us while we were working, and so it must belong in this song, but that's not true. It need not belong in that song at all. Um, it might be something that your inspiration threw up at you because that's been on your mind since breakfast. Um, or you had a dream about it last night. Inspiration is a lot like dreams. It's very non-linear. Um, uh, I think about this a lot. I talk about it a lot. Inspiration is not something that you can think, that you can just accept and go with. So when you get those inspired lines, if you just throw them into your song, it'll take you off in some direction you weren't planning to go. It'll take that song off somewhere. You're writing to a brief, to a music brief. You're writing to a listing. You're aiming for something. You either have an, a, a, you know, a, a theme or you have a, um, a core idea. I'll talk more about that later. Um, you have something you're supposed to be going for, and your inspiration may have been heading off in a completely different direction. So when that happens to you, um, instead of putting your, when you put your inspiration in there, when you put your inspired lines right in the song, then the song takes a left turn and it's going somewhere else. Now, you could say, well, I'll get to my chorus and I'll fix that. I'll, I'll, I'll say something in the chorus that really has to do with this pitch that I'm working on. And so you get to your chorus and you start writing those things. And it's a little awkward coming out of the first verse, but that's okay. Maybe you'll fix it in the second verse. And then so you get to your second verse. And as often happens in your second verse, it's like, what do I write about? You know, I, I don't know what I'm writing about because you don't know what you're writing about. You never stop to think about what you were writing about. You just accepted those inspired lines on their face. So this is a big um, problem when you're writing to a deadline or you're writing for a specific pitch or a music brief is that inspired lines can in fact get in the way. So just, you know, keep going. <laughs> just keep going. I'll address this in the time savers and tell you how to avoid doing that. Okay, the number three time waster is um, working too long on a song. Okay, working long time on a song is not necessarily making that song better. After you've been working on that song for a couple of hours, it starts to sound a little bit predictable, kind of cliched, sort of familiar. Maybe I should change these things here and I'll rework the melody on that chorus and I'll change these lines over here and pretty soon you have a song that's just this mishmash of changes and you've lost your perspective, you've lost your original idea, the, the, the impetus that drove you into the song, your idea, your original idea um, is gone. And so now you can't turn around and go back and start a new song. You, so now you're in the position of trying to rewrite what you rewrote. And um, again, this is a huge time waster. You don't want to be stuck doing that. Okay. Finally, the fourth time waster is pitching on everything or pitching only on the high paying opportunities. I've known people, um, I've, I have 
talked with people who have said to me, oh, I only pitch on those listings that say direct to music supervisor, uh, so I don't have to give up a piece of my song, and it's, um, you know, uh, payment paying up to $50,000, $35,000, whatever. Um, paying up to that doesn't mean they will pay that, but it's it could go that high. So those are the ones that I want to pitch on not, and nothing else. Doing that is kind of like chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow because you're never going to reach it. Um, it will be a total fluke if you if you land one of those. And I always tell people, don't don't play this your songwriting career like the lottery. It isn't a lottery. It's a business. And if you give the business what it needs, if you're able to do that, you will get what you need back. But if what you're doing is playing poker here and you're going for the high rollers, you know, the problem is that let's say that that high paying opportunity is for um, electronic dance music. OK, and you're mostly more folky in, uh, indie folk. That's mainly your genre. You like to be the acoustic side of things. But this one's paying so much. So. So you th you will pull together stuff and and throw it together, or try to get to meet that deadline. It'll take you longer than if you were working in the genre you're familiar with or a genre that uses your strengths. And and when you pitch it, you will most likely be competing with people for whom this is their primary genre. They have the knowledge, the experience, the samples. You know they've done this. And for you, this is fresh, this is new, you haven't got much experience with it yet. The chances of you beating out that other person are pretty minuscule. You might be able to do it, but the odds are really long. And I always believe in shortening the odds. So I would recommend that you do not use this time waster. Um, pitch on what you know. Pitch on those genres where you have experience, you have the resources. I'm going to talk more about that when I talk about time savers. Because obviously, there are ways to save time and avoid these time wasters. Okay, so before I go into the time savers, I just want to say there is a really easy way to spot your personal time wasters. Um, which are going to be one of these four things most likely, okay? So here's what we do. Learn to spot your time wasters, okay? Choose a genre or emotional mood to write a song in because that's what the opportunity is going to give you. It's going to give you a genre. It's going to give you uh, an emotional upbeat pop songs. That's It's right there, upbeat pop songs. Okay. Um, choose that on your own. And rough out a verse and chorus. I don't mean a polished. I just want you to, to write quickly. Get something on paper. Get something done. Um, if you write lyrics only, then just write a lyric, right? If you are going to be pitching on film and TV and you need to write the, the melody lyric chords and have your also do a demo, then you should write m lyrics, melody, chords, and at least groove because groove has a lot to do with that emotional mood, that energy, and it also has a lot to do with genre, right? So putting a groove in there may, and your chords is really all you need to do musically, and then your melody and lyrics on top of that to a verse and chorus. I would say try to do that in an hour. If you think you really can't, then do it in two hours. Give yourself two hours. Put a timer on your desk. I mean, really, stick to it. You know you've got two hours. you got to go for it. Okay, sit down and start writing. And then see which of these four time, time wasters uh, shows up first. Um, and then keep going. See if you can do it if, in a couple of hours. See how far you can get. And it'll, it'll really reveal your, your time wasters to you. And that will help you know what the problems are. So that once you identify them, you can, you can work backwards, right? And, and try to um, make some of those, get rid of some of those and substitute better habits for those. Okay. So let me do that now. I'm going to take you through a whole bunch of time savers and address all those time wasters we just talked about plus more. Okay, so the big giant list of time savers. Here we go. Be ready to write before you sit down, right? So we saw that earlier in the time waster. You sit down and go, I need an idea. I need an idea. Don't do that. Because that's the last place you're going to get an idea, okay? So what you want to do is have raw material and song starters, what I call song starters, ready before you get started, okay? Lists of titles, lyric phrases, music files, 
um, melody ideas, chords, and grooves. So you can just grab a groove and throw it in there. Have a bunch of them, right? Have a whole bunch of files ready to go. Just little bits of things is enough. And of course, a title uh, or an opening line um, is a great way to start because it, you can write down, you can use that title as the peak of your pyramid and then just, you know, write all the way down from that title and keep referring to it as your beacon so you stay on track. Right, so here's a list of some, I call them core ideas. Um, you could also call them themes if you want to. Um, themes, doesn't that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know what a theme is. Uh, maybe it means different things to different people. But core idea, that says it all to me. That's your central idea of your song, right? The central idea of your song. So um, here's some central ideas for you. I got a few listed here. This is the happiest day of my life. Core idea number, number two, you broke my heart. Number three, we're going to party all night. Number four, I never loved like this before. And number five, I will overcome this challenge. Now you've heard dozens of songs with e each for the each one of those core ideas because they're very common core ideas, right? And that also means that they're common scenes in film and TV because common experiences for people are what television is for the most part about. I mean, we get into some crazy stuff, you know, when we get into action scenes and things, but go for the drama. Look for the drama. Watch those daytime soaps. Yeah, watch watch the daytime dramas. You'll see these common scenes um, over and over and over again, these common core ideas. We also write songs about them because people can relate to them. They're common, right? So you want to pick one of those because not only can people relate to your songs, but also they'll work well for film and television. So pick your core idea, okay? And then um, look for the groove that goes with that core idea, okay? If it's, I will overcome this challenge, then it's going to be a, a swaggering kind of groove or a strut groove. Um, if it's a party song, we're going to party all night long, then take a look at some of those songs out there that are party songs like Sia's um, Cheap Thrills is a really good party song. Um, and it's got this tropical house, boom, chaboom, boom, chaboom. It's got a great tropical house beat underneath it. And Ed Sheeran uses the same beat for Shape of You. And I've heard it m several more times. It's a really popular beat. Um, it may come and go as a popular beat, but you can use that groove and make it more contemporary or adapt it to something you like a little better. See if you can find one of those grooves and then get in the mood to write your I'm going to party all night long song. Okay, so you can do that. Um, I'll talk more about lyrics for a song like that in a minute. Uh, keep your files all in one place so you can find them easily and, and you know, give them titles that, that say things like party groove or, you know, um, pop groove for party song. Title it that, pop groove for party song number one, number two, number 37, number 40, okay? Just so you, you know when you're doing a party pop song that you've got a place to go. And you can be more specific that, than that if you have, you know, a groove that's that's more dreamy pop, uh, dream pop groove with, uh, you know, sad dream pop groove uh, number 42. You can do all of that with your title. That's all you really need to do. And keep them in one place where you can find them, okay? Don't have them all over the place, on your phone, on your computer, in the cloud, on, you know, down on your desk, wherever. Try to keep them all in one place if you can do that. Okay, and if you do not have something in your raw material that will get you started on a song, then you have to crank up your creativity really fast. And you can do that. The best way I found to do that is to um, sing along with a song that's in that mood that has that mood and is in that genre. Sing along with it. Get your body in the groove that you want to be in. It's like it's like giving your body and your creativity the message, this is what I want. Okay, this is what I need, creativity. I'm talking to you now. Yeah, you. I need this. And if you do it in one song, more than one song, it doesn't matter. One song will do it. And just get into that mood. Get your body into the groove. Get yourself listening to lyrics. I'm not suggesting that you take anything from that song. You're not going to do that. But you're going to get the feel of what you want and give your creativity the message, this is what I'm doing, in case you weren't in the mood. Because a lot of times when we sit down to write a song, we're going, okay, now I have to do that, I have to do that. That's not a party pop mood. It's really not. So you have to get yourself into that. Okay, so that's going to help you get started. And that was the big time waster number one. Okay, um, 
Second one, uh, create a song sketch before you start. This is one of my favorite things to do because like I said with Inspired Lines, they get you off track. There are so many things that can get you off track when you're writing a song. You forget where you started. Oh, I started to write this party pop song, but I'm on verse two and I'm not feeling so party-ish. And so I'm writing things that don't make sense for a party pop song. Okay, all kinds of stuff can happen. Um, so what I want you to do is to give yourself a roadmap. Okay, so great painters, you know, they sketched out the stuff on the canvas before they filled it in with their fabulous oil paints. Um, we're going to do something similar. You're going to take your idea, your core idea that we just had, okay, because you do have to have that before you start. Otherwise, you're going to lose the whole song. So get your core idea, then take that core idea and sketch it out. So let's say, going to party all night long. That's my core idea. So here's how my... Um, my sketch might go. I'm going to start with a title. I went and looked through my rough titles, my list of titles, when I came up with this to do for you today, and I came up with Street Dancing. I like Street Dancing as a title because it's physical, it's visual, it's something that you might see in film and TV, and it makes me feel like it's kind of a loose, you're not at the nightclub, I don't, I'd, I'd rather be out on the street than in a nightclub myself, and, and so I, I like it. It feels good to me. That's always important. Remember I said you have to write authentically and honestly? Look for a title that moves you. That says, oh yeah, that makes me feel that too. Because it'll make other people feel it. Okay, so Street Danton. And I'm going to, for my sketch, I, I, I wrote it out here. Verse 1, I could do. Okay, um, I got, I'm in the 9 to 5 grind. I'm, I'm going to do the opposite for the first verse, let's say. I'm in the 9 to 5 grind. I feel like I'm going to explode out of my seat in this office. I can't take it anymore. It's Friday night and I'm going to go street dancing. Okay. Um, so that's how I would sketch out the first verse. Here's my problem. I got to bust out of here. And then chorus, let's go street dancing. I kind of like the let's idea, so I stuck that in there. Let's go street dancing, but you could do I'm going to go. Um, and then listeners are going to want to know what street dancing looks like or feels like or is like. So you got to give them some, some visuals or some examples of what it feels like to be moving down the street totally free in the, in the night with the music blaring out of the storefront. and the, Yeah, it, I mean, there's all kinds of things you could write in your chorus. It can be very general, which is, and I strut and I swagger and I do this and I do that and I meet my friends and all kinds of stuff you can put into that chorus. Then the second verse, I liked what I said about meeting my friends. So now I'm going to save that for the second verse. And the second verse will be, all my friends are here. And here's what we're doing together. And here's how we get closer together when we're street dancing. And here's how we move. And here's how, yeah. So you can get that whole thing into your second verse and know that you've got some place to go in your second verse before you even start your song. Then your second chorus is a repeat. Ah, let's put a bridge in this song. Okay? So my idea of a bridge is... It's sunrise. We danced all night, okay? It's sunrise. Feeling tired but free, and I'm going to do it all again tonight. Okay, so that would be my bridge. It's kind of a surprise, and it's fun, and it moves things along a little bit. It's almost sunrise. I probably wouldn't put it at sunrise. Almost sunrise. We've been going all night long, and I've still got energy. I want to do it all again. That's your bridge. Final chorus. You're done. Now, if you follow that sketch, you're going to be able to finish that song. Now, one thing... I want to suggest here, after I did that sketch, I looked at it and I went, you know, I could flip the second verse and the first verse. And I think this song would be more film and TV friendly. Okay? If I put that second verse up there in the first verse, I will be starting with, hey, my friends are here. We hit the hot places. We're, we're out on the streets and the street lamps and it's, the music is blaring and it's so much fun. Start with that. And then chorus, street dancing. We're all, let's go street dancing. We're all street dancing. And then go, yeah, every week, nine to five, I've got this grind. I got to get it down. Um, I'm going to bust out of here. Got it? That way, for film and television, the first thing that the music supervisor hears, or the showrunner, or the director of a film, the first thing they hear when they hear your song is the stuff that says, this is what street dancing is like, because that's the scene it's going to go in. You know it is. So, um, or a scene in a nightclub, or a scene somewhere where people are dancing and they're having a party out in the street, that's where it's going to be used. So you might as well put that first, and then put your problem second.
For radio, that doesn't matter so much. In radio, you will hear the problem first. And, and really, you know, when you're just writing a song, a lot of times we will start with the problem so that we can really open out and release that energy into the chorus. For film and TV, just a little bit of, of you know, game it a little bit and, and put, your, um, put the thing that's leading you straight to the chorus first. Okay, so that's just a hint there. All right, so um, here's another time saver. All right. Know what emotion you want to express and how to express it. Okay, so in street dancing, obviously the emotion is, I'm feeling energetic and happy. This is so much fun. I'm having the best time. Okay, so upbeat, happy, feel good. That's what that song is. So I know that's where I'm going to start. And I, need, I know then that the type of lyric language that I use, the type of melody, and the type of chords I'm going to use are all going to have to support that. So now I'm building a song, right? I'm building it up, layer one layer after another, and, and that's going to help me keep that song going all the way to the end so I don't get halfway through and have to make a U-turn or, or dump it and start a new song because you can't do that. Okay, so um, in film and TV, emotion... Is, it rules. And it's true, it's true of radio now, too, uh, especially pop radio and dance. It's all about emotion. Um, and so there are seven ingredients uh, in emotional songwriting, right? So we need to think about lyrics, melody, chords, rhythm, vocal, arrangement, and mix. Those are the seven ingredients, okay, of emotion in songwriting. And they all need to support each other. They have to. So that's what you need to be thinking about as soon as you know what emotion it is that you're writing. Okay? So, let's say, let's take another example. Let's get away from happy, feel good, and go really dark and sad. Okay, so let's say that it's looking for a dark song. Um, maybe it's about a breakup. Maybe they don't tell you that much. They just say dark, sad, <sighs> acoustic-based song. Okay? With a... Um, indie folk or alt country feel. I'm going to go for alt country, okay? Here are the lyrics to Cold by Chris Stapleton, which is alt country. It was just on the charts. And I promise you it will be used in film and TV in five minutes. Um, and uh, this is the chorus. Uh, love this lyric. Why you gotta be so cold? Why you gotta go and cut me like a knife? You put our love on ice. Oh, girl, you know you left this hole right here in the middle of my soul. Oh, why you got to be so cold? Okay, so if somebody's looking for a song uh, that's sad and has, a li and has some anger or resentment in it, because that's really there, that puts some energy on that song. Okay, he's got words like cold, knife, cut, ice, left this hole in the middle of my soul. All you need are those words. That's all the listener needs, and they know what to feel. Now, that song has got to have a melody and chords and a groove that supports that. If you go listen to that song, which I highly recommend, Cold by Chris Stapleton, you will hear how he did it. What he's using there are what I call trigger words. Once you know the, the emotional energy that you want, then you look for trigger words that will make the listener feel that. It's almost as if you can't help feeling that cold, knife, cut, left this hole, ice. Yeah, it's almost like you can't help feeling there's something dark and, and painful here. Um, because those words mean that to us. They trigger those feelings in the listener. So that's what you want to be doing is get to your listener right away. Get to them beyond their thinking process. Get to them in their physical sensations. Get to them in their, in, into their imagination. Ice cut like a knife. You can't help seeing that, right? And that puts you in the mood for the song. So all of that works really well, and it helps, and it describes the emotion that he's feeling. The music will underscore that lyric and create the same emotion. In this song, the chords um, emphasize minor chords. If you were doing the street dancing song, you're going to emphasize major chords. Now, no chord progression is all major or, or all minor. You, they are there, but they're very boring chord progressions, actually. And so we go through a mix of major and minor in all chord progressions. And, of course, you can add all of your sevenths and, and you know, your add two, add four, sus, sus four chords and things like that. But still, basically, you're going to emphasize either D minor seven or D major seven, okay? Um, or, D, or D major or D minor. 
And so if you're emphasizing chords that are minor, what you're doing is starting with minor chords, maybe ending with a minor chord, start with a major, end with a major if you're going to go major on us. So in cold, his chords are A minor, E minor, D minor, F major 7, E7. Interesting ending. See, he goes minor, 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 and then all of a sudden he turns sevenths. Sevenths are bluesy, tends to be, tend to be bluesy chords. Okay, not the major seven, but E seven, dominant seven, is going to be a little bit bluesy. So it and it does and it is. Go check that song out. Okay, um, next, next saver. Um, I want you to create lists. Lists are so important. Create lists and keep adding to them. They're a huge time saver. Okay, so besides a list of core ideas, which I talked about earlier. Um, I want you to keep lists of uh, potential titles and, and lyric hooks. That's a great place to start. I was using that when I did street dancing. I went to my list of titles. I knew I was looking for something upbeat, poppy, and street dancing was what I found. I had like five more I could have used. Okay, so you want lists with lyric hooks, something you might use for the payoff line of your chorus. The lyric hook, the, one, the line you want people to remember, that's probably also going to be your title. It may also be the first line of your chorus, in which case you've got two lines of your chorus written. Okay, so get your lists going of titles and hook lines. You can get those from, you know, eavesdropping on your friends, conversations, um, uh, titles. I'd say, oh, listen to watch TV. Again, the daytime dramas are a real source for emotional lines. People say really ridiculous things that work well in songs, even if they're a little bit odd. Uh, when they come out of somebody's mouth in conversation. But uh, the soaps get away with that. So um, that's a, a, a good uh, source for those. Lists of rhymes. I'm going to suggest this, even though we all know that we could go online and look for a, you know, rhyme desk or brhymes.com, you know, we could go there. Um, but I find that they have a lot of words I would never use in a song. Um, I wanted to rhyme gone. And all I'm interested in is the vowel, the vowel rhymes. That's all I want, near rhymes, vowel rhymes. So I came up with a, on Rhyme Desk with fraught and brawn. I'm not going to use brawn in a lyric. I'm not, you know. It's just not it's conversational. It's going to sound wrong. It's going to sound weird. So if I'm looking for rhymes, I want to look at rhymes I want to use. So I keep a list on a, it's just in a text file. And I keep it just organized by, a, you know, letter, long A, short A, long E, short E, and single syllable and double syllable. And I just add to it as I come across lyrics. So let me give you an example here of um, rhymes with even. Let's say I want to rhyme the word even. I have got breathing, believe in, freedom, sleeping, reason, bleeding, leaving, leaving. I would use all of those words in a song. Absolutely. Um, I probably wouldn't rhyme it with t-shirt, even though the E is there, the long E, but the second syllable is too, too distant. I can't even kind of throw it away and get away with it, even t-shirt, no. Um, but I can rhyme t-shirt with speaker, speakers, like, you know, uh, amplifiers, speakers, t-shirts, be sure, reassure, and leisure. I don't know if I'd use leisure or not, but I might. Okay, so I heard I was I was working out to some dance music, which I do, and um, so I get to hear a chance to hear what what's happening in dan in club dance, um, and because there's a whole channel of it on on uh, Directv of club dance stuff, and I exercise to it. So along came this song, and here were the rhymes. So a couple of rhymes, over and composure. This was in a song by David Guetta with Becky Hill. It was a big one. I wouldn't think of rhyming composure with anything, but I have to say, composure and over really works in this particular song. I'm, I'm, you know, we're so over. I'm not going to lose my composure. We <laughs> something like that. It was really cute. Um, if you're doing something arch like that, you can do it. So I'm not saying you'll find all your rhymes in your own rhyme list, but your basic ones that get you going. And and when you sit there and look at your list of rhymes, it has a tendency to spark more. So, you know, if you're, you're reading even, leave and reason, believe in, you're likely to go, hmm, and come up with like five more and just add those to your list. 
Okay. Sometimes I get sparked by a song that's got a lyric uh, rhyme in it that I really like. I'll make a note of the song that I got it from so that I don't accidentally steal something that's um, going to be recognizable. Okay. Another list you can make, I won't go into this one in such detail, but another list you can make that's really, really good is uh, lists of this is like that. That's what I call my list. This is like that. Lists of comparisons. Okay. So falling in love feels like and then just every time you think of something that falling in love feels like, you add it to your this is like that list so that you have some comparisons to drop into your song when you're needing one. Okay, heartbreak feels like, and if you go back, if you listen to that song Cold, you're going to hear a great description of heartbreak. He said, when you broke my heart, it shattered like a rock through a window. I love that. It shattered like a rock through a window. Heartbreak is like that. And I've never heard anybody describe it that way. It was a brilliant comparison. And so make that list. Make that list so you're, they're ready. Because when you want one, you won't be able to think of any. That's the trick of all of this stuff. Okay. Use your strengths. Use your strengths. Remember when I talked earlier about um, pitching on every listing or trying to just pitch on, the li on listings, any listing that wasn't your strength? that you didn't have a lot of experience and knowledge in. Um, that's where this comes in. Use your strengths. Assess your strengths. Um, don't try to pitch on everything. Pitch on the thing, areas where you have strengths. So to do that, sit down one afternoon or evening or whatever and make a list of your strengths. What have you got that you can go to quickly and use and doesn't cost you much? Okay, because resources are at a premium here. If you're going to pitch a lot and write a lot and you want a lot of songs in your catalog, you can't be spending a ton of money on every song. Yeah, so you don't want to have to go hire an expensive producer to do big EDM stuff. You should be doing, if you're going to do EDM, electronic dance music, you're going to want to be your own producer because that's the best way to make it cheap enough to have a sizable catalog. Remember, all of this comes back to wanting to have a sizable catalog, being able to write quickly and write your best. All right, so this is what we're talking about here. If you're writing to your strengths you, and your resources, you have the best chance of writing more songs that are good, that are pitchable. All right, so when you do this, write down the genres you can do. And that means if you're acoustic based, you may not want to write down the big uh, keyboard based genres like EDM. You're going to write down the indie folk, folk, acoustic, uh, Americana, alt country. These are acoustic based. Right? And, you'll, and you can think of some more. But if you're going to get into electronica and you don't have a really extensive knowledge of your keyboard and your plugins and what's current, you're going to have a lot of trouble pitching on that. And it's going to be expensive for you and it's going to take time. So that's what you don't want to do. Okay, so look for the genres you know. Make a list of your resources, the instruments you can play, um, what you can record. Uh, whether you can sing or not, or whether you have to hire a singer to come in for that particular so type of song, and how much money you're going to have to spend. What, can you al what do you already have in, in your resources? Or who can you trade something with? Right? That's a really important one, too. You've got stuff you can trade. You can bring in more people. You can widen the genres you're pitching on. Anything that gives you an edge will be helpful. So, if you have a talent for playing harmonica... Um, if you're really good at harmonica, or if you're really good at um, brass, any live horns, because music libraries so often hear synth horns, and there are ways to use them that's kind of cheating, but it sounds okay, um, but you can't do it for very long. Um, and so if you can play live horn well enough to play on your own tracks or to play on other people's tracks, that's a big resource for you. That is a big plus. People are really hungry for that. Any instrument that they can't get that's popular. So harmonic is popular in alt country and it's popular in indie folk and Americana. And if you're a good harmonica player, you can write Americana songs and play harmonica. Uh, and also you can um, trade with other people who can't play harmonica. Okay, so that's a strength for you. Choose your then, then you can look at your list of strengths. You can choose your targets. And then uh, once you've chosen your target, you go for it. Okay, your targeted genre, your targeted song style, targeted pitch list, pitch uh, listing that you want to pitch on. Okay, good. All right. Now, um, of course, I've got another one or two. Uh, here we go. Use reference songs and artists. This is huge. 
This is absolutely huge, and I'm surprised that more people don't do it. Using reference songs and artists to get unstuck or solve a problem. I've mentioned reference songs as I've gone along here and said, go find a song with a groove like in, that's in the emotional energy space that you want and listen to that groove and then see if you can do something similar but not rip it off. Adapt it to your own song, to your own taste, not steal. Okay, um, that's using a, a reference song to get a groove and pick up the amount of time it takes you to get a song started. So that's not necessarily getting unstuck. But what if you're halfway through a song and you you get to a transition, let's say transitioning into your chorus and you just can't figure out how to get from your pre-chorus into your chorus. It's just the chords aren't working. It's not happening. I would say at that point, go to, you know, go to a song with pre-chorus and chorus in the style you're working in and listen and look at the chords they're using for that turnaround. Because what you're going to have to do is probably change a chord, but you've probably tried everything. So then you're going to have to change the melody, and you've probably tried all that, but not with the same chords. Um, so go, listening to a reference songs that have solved that problem will give you three or four solutions. If you look for three or four reference songs that do it, you'll have those solutions. Can't think of what to say in your second verse? You should be able to if you did a song sketch. But if you didn't do that, shame on you, and you should go look at some reference songs and listen to their second verses and see how they did that. What did they say that they didn't say in the first verse or the chorus, but still needed to be said? Okay, that's how a reference song can help you. They can also help you with arrangement. How did they build that arrangement? They started with a small first verse, of course. They built to the first chorus. What instruments did they take out or did they add when they went to the second verse? What did they do? Just make a map of, of some of these um, arrangement ideas and then say, ah, oh, they added an instrument here. I'll add an instrument. It won't be the same one, maybe. Okay, did they add a percussion instrument or did they bring in another guitar to double the first guitar? What did they do in that arrangement as the song went forward? Um, take a look at a song like Blackout by Freya Ridings. It builds from the beginning to the end. And it's a huge ending, absolutely huge ending. And so when you're doing an anthemic song, an, an anthem, a song that really builds like that, um, you could take a look at that. That song is angry, um, uh, resentful. But if you look at Roar by Katy Perry or Firework by Katy Perry, you're going to see how an arrangement builds by looking at those songs. It doesn't mean that your song will sound anything like that. You're just looking at the structure of an arrangement if that's not something you have done before. If you didn't go to school to learn arranging, and even if you did go to school and learn arranging, if you want to stay current with what's happening in arranging, you're going to be pulling these songs apart and listening to them, picking them apart with your ears, and writing down what you hear so that when you go to do your next song, you go, yeah, I liked that idea. I'm going to add electric piano there, but then I'm going to use organ when I go to the chorus. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay, so that'll give you some ideas. Um, all right. Uh, here are a couple of quicker ones um, that will be helpful. Repurpose an older song. Um, this is a good idea. I have seen people actually, it's tricky because you can actually spend more time repurposing an older song than writing a new one if you do, if you follow what I've been talking about, okay? But if you want to repurpose the older song, the first thing I would say is, is the older song in the right genre? If you're going to be changing genres, um, rough it out first to sit down and, and play and sing it rough in the new genre and see if it works. Um, if it's dated, how will you update it quickly? Uh, that might just be um, the, the rhythm track, using a loop in, and adding a loop to it, or adding a loop to the existing drum track if it was recorded to a click track. Don't try to do that to something that wasn't recorded to a metronome or a click track, okay? Um, because that'll take you longer than you, you will be alive uh, to cut a loop to that. Um, but I would say there are things you can do, and rhythm is one of the more contemporary uh, ways we give songs a current feel. So if you take a look like a song like Uptown Funk, 
the, the Mark Ronson and, and Bruno Mars song, what you'll hear is a funk song, but the rhythm track is, is not as loose. And um, it, it's interesting. It's a much tighter looped rhythm track. And that helps to give that song its current feel. But it keeps it away from, uh, it takes it away from that, that deep groove. You know, you, it's a tricky thing to do. Okay, so decide if you want to do that if you're going to repurpose an older song for something you're pitching on to save time. Um, uh, and lyrics, by the way, now are much more vivid and much more audience engaging than older lyrics. We can't stay on the surface now in lyrics. We really get that. Use those trigger words I was talking about earlier to get your audience engaged in the song really quickly. Um, really emotional words, vivid words, physical sensations like he was using in cold. Um, use those kinds of words. So you're going to have to update the lyric as well if the song is older. Okay, don't stay on the surface. Okay, um, that's a possibility. I'm not, in, I'm not too enthusiastic about it, as you can tell. Refer often to your original idea, genre, or goal. When you start a song, write that stuff out in really big felt marker and stick it on the wall in front of you. Because it's so easy to get off, way off, right? And when you get off, you it's so hard to get back on again. You have to go back. You have to re change. You have to change things. It's taking up more time. Better to just not get off track right right from the beginning. So your original idea, your original impetus to write the song is probably your best one. You're not going to be making it better by changing it. Um, you're going to be making it better by doing it better. Okay, write that on the wall too. That's pretty good. Um, the better you do that idea, the the better it, the more it will work for that listing because that was the idea that that listing suggested to you. Okay, so that's where you want to end up is where you started. You just want to end up with a song that's good, that does what you started to do. So keep that on the wall. When you're done with that song, take it off the wall, check it out and put the next one up. It'll make you feel like you really accomplished something too. Okay, so refer often that uh, to that uh, original idea that you had. Um, here's another one. Ah, this is a good one. Use the fresh ears test. I talk about this a lot in my courses. The fresh ears test. When you're rewriting, this is essentially what a rewrite is, and it's the only way I've ever found to make a song, to rewrite a song and really do it, actually make it effective. But if you're writing fast, then you're going to start rewriting as soon as you finish your first, your sketch and your first rough draft. Then you're going to be rewriting because you're going to be listening to the song over and over and making those tweaks and adding the arrangement and adding to the lyric, adding to the creating the vocal, um, making sure the chords are exactly what you want. You're going to be listening a lot. And what happens is we lose perspective. And we, that's that same that problem of losing perspective. If you've been working all night long, don't do that because you lose perspective and you start making changes you shouldn't make. So the, the solution to that is the fresh ears test. You When you finish... You get to a point where you say, this is, this is pretty good. I think I'm on the right track here. This is good. You record it. And if you're, re if you're doing lyrics only, um, record it. Walk away after you record it. Because you're going to come back and listen like a listener would. And if you're playing guitar or you're playing keyboard or you're reading your own lyric, even if you're reading out loud, it's not the same as sitting at a distance listening to it and being your own audience. Because this is the only way I could have found to do it. So record what you got right there, rough recording, just do it, lay it down on anything, go away, walk away, walk away, go do the dishes, take a walk around the block, watch some TV, whatever. Then come back when you've forgotten what you did, when you've gotten what you did out of your mind, come back and play your recording. And as you play that recording, make notes of what you want to change. Oh gosh, that got so confusing. Wow, that I overwrote that. I can't even follow that. What was I doing? I mean, you're going to do a lot of that, <laughs> okay? I, listeners aren't going to be able to follow that. It's just I I read it. I just worked on it too much, and I began skipping things that listeners need to know, right? That happens all the time. So you go in, uh, you sit down, you open up that file, and you start making the changes that you made a list of. Just make those changes. Make those changes, record it again, walk away, go do some more dishes, walk around the block, whatever. Okay, come back and listen again and make notes and record it and walk away, come back, listen, make notes. It's the fresh ears test. It goes over and over and over. And this is how you rewrite and you get the song closer and closer to where you want to be rather than 
just getting too complicated or losing perspective or overwriting or getting bored and changing things you shouldn't change. Okay, so this is a really important thing, the fresh ears test. Okay, um, and finally, my last one, my, my last time saver, um, be a songwriter all the time. You can be a songwriter when you're at work, no matter what your job is. Um, I've had friends who were waitresses, and they would eavesdrop on conversations at tables. They were not sp probably supposed to, but how can you avoid that, you know? And, and then on the lunch break, they'd go write down all the stuff they heard. Um, when you can play music, do your research into reference artists and, and song, reference songs, and make lists. I have whole lists of songs, and I'll say, oh, this has a great chorus, or I love the structure on this. This is, this is a really interesting structure. Um, uh, I just sent out a newsletter with the stuff you could play with, and a lot of the stuff that came, you know, song craft you can play with, and you don't have to, like, play by the rules. Um, and, and all of that stuff, uh, it came from my lists of, thing, of interesting things I've written down on these lists of, um, here's reference songs. Here's a reference song for a guitar sound that I love. I love that Liz Lindsay Buckingham sound, and you hear it. Um, uh, now you'll hear it in, in current singer-songwriters, certain current singer-songwriters that I really like, like Nora, Noah, Noah Gunderson uses it. And um, I love that that particular guitar sound. And it's very contemporary now. Uh, it, it has come back into singer-songwriter style. And so I've got, you know, not just Lindsay Buckingham, but I've got Noah Gunderson listed under that, and people who are using it in a contemporary song because they may be using it differently. I've got reference songs for vocal sounds that I like that maybe I think I could do, or I'm going to have to bring somebody in. I've got lists of songs that are just electric guitar and vocal. There's a wonderful version of Crazy, the Gnarls Barkley hit by Daniela Andrade that's just electric guitar and vocal. I have a whole list of those because it's cheap to do and it's really moody. It's really cool, right? Go listen to Mad World, the cover by Gary Jules. It's on YouTube from the film Donnie Darko. And um, oh, it's so spooky and cool. And it's the original hit was Tears for Fears. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do covers, but um, you can hear the national. He'll do things that are just um, fireproof, I think is the name of one, that's just electric guitar and vocal. And that's been used in a number of film and TV shows. You can do those inexpensively and quickly. So uh, reference songs for arrangements that are cheap to do are a great thing to have a list of if you're going to have to do your own arrangements. Okay, so you get the idea here. And then you can make lists of reference songs for artists, for, for lyric styles in pop. What kind of style? I like Dua Lipa a, like, a, a lot. I like um, pop dance. And I like Dua Lipa. I like Pink. Um, and I'll make lists of the, my favorite songs of theirs. And when I need to write a pop dance song, I'll go look at What About Us by Pink, which has some gorgeous imagery in it. The very first verse, um, we are rockets pointed straight at the stars. It's just, it's just gorgeous. Um, and uh, so I have lists of those that not only are they good reference for me when I need it, you know, just to get inspired or get into the mood, um, you know, they're also going to suggest things to me that I might not have thought of. I can't steal anything from them, but it puts me in the mood and it gets my brain turned on, my creative brain turned on, and gets me thinking that way. So remember in the very first one, I, I said, um, you know, you get your creativity, when you have to get your creativity turned on fast, go sing along with a song that's in the style you want. Because that's going to turn on your creativity, which is just another muscle in your body. That's what I learned. That's what I learned years ago, writing for the Disney Channel, when I had to write three or four songs a week. It's not a cute little bird that comes and nestles on your shoulder there, and you might scare it off if you look at it. It's not. It's a muscle, and it is physical. And so the more you train yourself physically to be in the genre, to be in the mood, to be in the energy, the faster you will be able to write that song, and the better it will be. The more knowledge you have, the better it will be. People who say to me, but I'm writing the best I can. I'm writing the fastest I can. This is the best I can do. Go learn something tonight, and what you write tomorrow will be better than what you wrote today. It's not your best. You can be better. Every day of your life, you can be better. Trust me, I'm still doing it. I've been doing it a long time, and I am still learning. Okay, so just to wrap that up, 
practice. You can practice all of these things. Just go through the time savers and practice those. Do that little exercise that'll show you your time waster. It, it's it wasters. It's such a good exercise. It's such good knowledge to have. And then you see where your weak spots are and where you need to pick things up. Use those time savers. Hone your skills. Be ready to write faster and better the very next time you write. Thank you for being here today. I have really enjoyed putting all this together for you. And I can't wait to see the, what the songs are that you come up with. Okay? May your songs flow. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.